Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 497. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Monday, the 25th of March, the Feast of the Annunciation, when Gabriel came to Mary and asked her to say, I do. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, almost to episode 500. I just, you know, few things at this age get me excited. Hitting the 500, that's going to do it. I mean, that's a that's a big celebration. We've been doing this for many, many years. It's been a lot of fun, and we'll see what happens. Before we get to 500, and before you even get to the end of this episode, please share. Please uh, comment in the comment section. Please subscribe if you've not subscribed yet. Uh, anything else? Oh, tweet uh, and retweet, and just be part of the conversation. It's uh, It's... It's neat that this program is still growing. Lots of news to cover, but uh, generally when the three of us get together, we want to do one topic. And we sat down in our pre-show and one topic kind of really really appeared uh, to come out. And that is, what are we willing to compromise? Uh, Kind of the bigger topic. And we've seen this in politics. We've seen this in the church. And now in this day of social media, we're seeing less and less people willing to put their hand up and let their voice be heard because of the attacks and the trolls that can uh, certainly occur. And we see this with every topic, uh, and especially uh, social media's favorite topics, uh, whether it be LGBTQ uh, rights or whether it be uh, liberal politics or you're just not fitting in line or this whole new animal farm Uh, motif that's going on in our world. However, we're going to speak, hopefully, just to the politics and maybe bring up politics, church politics, and bring up social politics as references as well. Um, Gavin, you surprised George and I with some information, and I thought we'd kind of go with that, starting first with the Church of Wales. George, um, there's news from the Church of Wales, but... um, I don't know why we even talk about the Church of Wales. They're kind of small. Church of Wales, uh, they in 2017, 1% of the Welsh population went to church on Easter and Christmas in Church of Wales congregations. So roughly, that's about as many people who go to Episcopal Church in the USA, Christmas and Easter churches, as a proportion of the U.S. population. And it's not that everybody's in the chapel or in the Catholic Church. Uh, Wales is a fairly secularized nation. And the Church of Wales is farther down the road the Church of England has taken into irrelevance. Well, two things have happened recently. Once there was a Welsh Welsh Evangelical Conference in Cardiff, where where Evangelicals, Charismatics, and some Anglo-Catholics got together to plot a way forward for the Church in Wales and faithfulness. There's six bishops in the Church of Wales. They're all solidly on board the gay agenda. The Church in Wales does not permit alternative oversight. It's not a friendly environment for traditional Anglicans of any stripe. And uh, this conference, which was keynoted by Michael Nazarali, Philip North, uh, Lorna Ashworth, and Lee Gaddis, uh, basically was there to encourage the troops, but also to begin discussions, what do we do in this situation? Meanwhile, across town, the bishop of uh, in Cardiff, June Osborne, has turned over an inner city parish to the people at Holy Trinity Brompton. And this, when I shared this news with Gavin, Gavin said, well, I'm not in the least surprised she would do that. June Osborne is a very ferocious liberal, yet she's allowing a conservative uh, import into her diocese. And I said, I couldn't quite make Kevin and I couldn't make heads or tails of that until Gavin explained why. <clears throat> well, when I was um, at, at um, university in Brighton, uh, they had a problem about the big cathedral church, um, cathedral-like church of St. Peter's in Brighton. It was falling down. It had no congregation. And the question was, should it be sold or could it be revitalized? And some very energetic and imaginative people decided, why don't we give it to HTB, uh, St. Peter's Brighton? And so they did that, and they brought a a, a bright new charismatic vicar down. And I was very excited about this. And uh, 
I became a kind of minder for a while. I introduced him to the clergy in the very large deanery. Uh, I warned him what the issues were. Some, um, some, some lesbian women clergy from the Metropolitan Church, the gay church, came to the original meetings, which we hosted at the university, and set out to trap him and attack him and require him to swear allegiance to the liberal agenda or they would rubbish him. And with great skill, he sidestepped many of their questions and began what has turned out to be a very, very successful ministry. The church now uh, has, has very large numbers and it concentrates on housing the homeless, of whom there are many in Brighton. So what's not to like? The, the reason this began, I began to be, find some concern in this was as I asked questions, I began to hear uh, talk, and, and we need to establish whether this is true or not, but I've raised this publicly a couple of times and it's never been denied. But one of the things the HTV was doing was inviting gay couples into his marriage preparation classes. Now, the reason for doing this is, is fairly straightforward. It's not deceptive at all. It's, it's well, we need to get Jesus to people uh, so that they can repent. Um, we mustn't allow barriers unnecessarily to come between people and their hunger for the gospel. This would this would just about be okay if at some stage we heard that when people had come to Christ, they had indeed repented and, and they said so. But you can you can see the problem immediately. If in the HTB network you had people who had approached Alpha as as gay, committed or provisional couples, finding Jesus hearing the gospel required them to hand over their sexuality as they proclaim Jesus as Lord, they would start saying so. Um, so whether I'm right or not, they still haven't started saying so, so I might be right. Um, and what we then have is a, is, a, is a charismatic evangelical spirituality that reaches out to, to offer conversion, but not repentance or transformation on the most important issue of our time. Um, again, that wouldn't matter a great deal if there was some kind of gap between what happens on the surface and underneath. If somewhere underneath there was a very clear understanding of what the cultural issues were for holiness and repentance. But we don't hear that. So my concern is that HTB is being used to, to, to pull people in. Uh, to bring them to Jesus, to, to get them to finance the church. June Osborne would be really quite pleased about the, the diocesan quota being met like that. But if they're no threat to the liberal, uh, pansexual, secularized agenda, then then it, it's not the kind of Christianity that we're looking for to revive the West. There is, it, it, oh. I, I was you just saying that. Go for it. This conference of Welsh evangelicals took place in Cardiff, and this Holy Trinity Brompton church plan is taking place in Cardiff. And were I uh, one of these Welsh evangelicals who had come for encouragement, who had come for fellowship, Welsh is a small province. The clergy, many of them know each other, and it's good for them to get together and feel that they're standing together. And they find that with the bishop's support, the bishop who's their enemy, the bishop support, in essence, all the oxygen of their movement is now going to be sucked out by the uh, evangelical light uh, congregation that's going to be planted at by Holy Trinity Rompton in Cardiff. So, I would find this to be profoundly discouraging. That the way forward, the way forward is not faithfulness. Hmm. The way forward is not recou recouping and recovering the traditional Anglican way. It's a form of go along and get along that includes surrendering on one of the major issues facing the church today. That's what it appears to me from the outside. I think it's the now I've taken Alpha. Uh, we our church did Alpha for a while and used it as an evangelism tool. One of my critiques of Alpha has it's always been non creedal and doesn't require uh, a belief in a confession of sin. Uh, they'd have no trouble letting you know that you're sinful, that your ways are uh, not the ways of God. But in the end, there's never in my mind the, the closing of the deal, the what do you need to do to be holy and straight with God, not just the knowledge that the two of you are separated. Well, I, I want to defend Alpha. I mean, our parish is running one of these courses right now. And uh, it's, I, what I, you, it's what you do with Alpha. It's, in other words, Alpha sort of lights a little spark in some people. And I, then it's up to the congregation to take it forward. 
I believe but in that. It, and but if I people think, just stop with Alpha, you're you're basically hardly along the road. Right. And I think I, I'm a supporter of Alpha. I'm a supporter of Trinity Brompton. I'm a supporter of that whole movement. It's just a critique I have. Well, where's the where's the 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 home run at the end? And so that's what that's my the, critique. One of the more exciting things that happened to me about twenty years ago was that I was invited to be interviewed for a rather posh church in London, a place called St Paul's Knightsbridge, and um, uh, I remember <laughs> it ended up with my telling Bishop Charters how to run his diocese better, which he didn't thank me for. Um, but that small vignette aside, one of the things that I would have wanted to do was to have a, a triangular relationship between HTB, St. Paul's Knightsbridge, where I might have gone, uh, and St. Luke's Chelsea. Uh, and what we would have, what I, I thought we might have done would be to have uh, th three stages of Christian teaching, almost, almost uh, rather like Erickson's developmental models in psychological maturation. Uh, and, and that for, for sort of evangelism and pepping, you'd go to HTB. And then if you wanted some theology and sacraments, you'd, you'd go to the other two. And there would be a kind of um, circular track that, 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 that represented the richness of the kingdom of heaven, rather than people getting stuck into a, a kind of branded uh, sort of Christianity that never took you beyond the comfort zone of what it was. I still like that vision, and there may be some scope for it in other places, but the the problem is that just as Kevin said, if you were an evangelical uh, priest in Cardiff trying very hard, working against the zeitgeist to introduce people in Jesus into evangelism, and the great truck monster HTB came in <laughs> sucking all, because they do it so well, um, it would be very, it would be very demoralizing indeed. I, I think it, the theological issue it raises for me is the one that George articulated before we began the program, and that is, um, to what extent are you allowed to have a gap between what you present in public and what you do in in private? Uh, in one sense, the, we're increasingly coming into a time where there may be a gap. I can see, for example, that priests and congregations may want to say. Uh, easier things about Jesus on the surface and deal with the teaching about transformation and sexual ethics in, in the private place of consenting adults as catechumens did in the fourth century. But if you, even if you have that, that publicity gap, that information gap, you still need to have that transformation taking place within the heart of the church. And I think my concern at the moment, both in terms of HTB uh, and the issues we talked about is that that doesn't seem to be happening as far as we can tell. It's interesting. I, I, well, I, I want to give an example here. Uh, back a long time ago, Barack Obama was elected president, and he was asked, who would you like to have uh, give the prayer at your inauguration? And he said, go find somebody. They found Rick Warren. Uh, and basically the deal with Rick Warren was... Uh, we've seen your website. We are a supporter of you. We love your book, uh, the, the 40 Days of uh, Purpose Driven Life. We want you to be America's pastor. However, you need to completely clean your website of anything dealing with uh, conversion of homosexuals and uh, a transformation and all that type of thing. No LGBT anything. You got to do it. Rick Warren and his team spent the weekend completely cleaning the website, cleaning uh, out the church pews and the, and the back of the church, any pamphlets and stuff like that, uh, in order that Rick Warren could become America's pastor. He was able to compromise that um, for whatever reason, and he became America's pastor and had a ministry doing that. Is that worth a compromise? Yeah. Just putting that out there. I can't answer that question mm. uh, because I think it, it, in there are a number of bumptious idiots in the clergy who who uh, present a worldview of it's my way or the highway. Usually they're young and they try to grow fuzzy beards, but uh, uh, they're the people who basically have this view of Christianity and it's very rigid and it's very doctrinaire and it's this way and there's no pastoral sensitivity in how you bring about the conversion of people. 
That being said, their hearts are in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, their methods are pretty terrible. Then at the other hand, you have uh, these sort of wishy-washy clergy who know the truth and want the truth, but they're uh, empowered by numbers and prestige and power. And if they can get the ball rolling and they can sort of finesse these issues, they're happy to do that. Am I going to condemn both sides? Uh, maybe in part, but I, I, I'm, I'm loath to I'm loath to uh, say that here is the fixed line that you cannot cross, because I think uh, I, I'm uncomfortable. <clears throat> I'd like to bring in two variables, I think, which might help us a bit, um, and their context and vocation. So I, I think, first of all, we have to say that, that it is for all of us to stand before the Lord and answer to him. And if, if we say to our, the rest of the church, look, the Lord has called me to this ministry, then <clears throat> the rest of the church needs to step back and say, fine, well, We'll look for some fruits, but but okay, we'll support you if that's what you feel you're called to do. The other thing is context, and that is, to some extent, I spent 25 years in university uh, presenting myself as everybody's friend and an intellectual and psychological liberal. I certainly was an intellectual and psychological liberal. I just happened to be traditionalist greedily. Uh, but, and I, I think during that quarter of a century, uh, it was a legitimate thing to do and there were certainly fruits people got converted however I think context is important because the context is changing I couldn't do that again partly because the liberals have become much the progressives have become much more astute about the kind of tests that they're willing to present to people to ascertain whether or not you have a role in the public space in other words they've, they've tightened up the test and I think we may have come to the point, a bit like the early church and persecution, you know, that the test in the early church in the Diocletian persecutions was, here's a piece of incense, here's a statue to the emperor, now uh, sacrifice to the God. <laughs> and uh, some Christians said, well, he's not a real God, so I'm not doing anything really bad, so I will, and I won't go to the lions. And other people said in, in the context, this is the moment I've been called for, waiting for for the whole of my life, I'm going to go to the lions. Uh, context and vocation. We have to leave one's each other's vocation to each other's heart and prayers, but the context is becoming more like the Diocletian persecutions. The environment we're in are ramping up the, the, the tests to discover whether we really do belong to another worldview or whether we can be uh, included into the uh, into whatever the secular version is. It's becoming much more difficult to do that nowadays. Well, we now have I, a modern version of this with Pope Francis in China. Yeah. I Let, let me uh, uh, offer an, opinion, an example uh, of a news story that I, for me sums up this issue of uh, where do we draw the line and the difficulty. Uh, there was a very big news story out of Romania, of all places. A uh, Romanian Orthodox priest broke with his bishop. The bishop signed this Crete agreement the Orthodox world put together about ecumenism. Uh, this was re repudiated by the Russians, who don't believe in ecumenism, as do a large swath of the <clears throat> Orthodox world. And the local bishop... Uh, the, 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 the local parish priest in Romania essentially walled himself off from his bishop with good orthodox practice because he believed his bishop was a heretic because the bishop was willing to engage in ecumenism with the non-orthodox world. It went to court and the court in Romania found in favor of the local priest because 99% of the congregation uh, essentially uh, signed the petition saying we support our priest and and we look to uh, mother russia no longer to the metropolitan in uh, bucharest for uh for support in short it was an acna episcopal church fight but among the romanian orthodox now from an outsider's position uh the issue of ecumenism is not something i would break with over my bishop in other words for me that's i sort of scratch my head why is this priest so exercised well, if you read his arguments, of course, if you divert from the true, true church in any form, you're leading your people into hell. And so uh, Gavin has uh, very well-articulated views that I hear and I understand them. I 
just not there where they occupy the same place in my heart that they do in his. I appreciate and understand and support his views for them, but I, I'm not there as he is. So my, my, w the point that I'm trying to make is if I, I can make, I can say, oh, the silly Romanians, or isn't Gavin romantic because he's sometimes quixotic? What do people look at me and say, George, why are you going to die in this ditch as opposed to that ditch? And I, I'm, I wish there was a leadership or something that could say, this is the line that we're all going to die in. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and I, I guess my hope is that we have a reunion of Christendom that sort of sets the parameters. Gavin has raised before, and he needs to raise it again and again. We are not here to refight the battles of 500 years ago. I'm not worried about indulgences. It really doesn't bother me. I'm not going to break with my fellow Christians over indulgences or whether faith versus works or this and that. Um, I'm willing to break over personal holiness, but, but then I'm just hoping there's an articulation of what <clears throat> these boundaries and structures are that makes uh, makes it easier for me. That's a silly way to put it, but well, it makes it easy. Makes it easier for everyone. If I can be personal for a moment, one of the things that's happened since my wife has become a Catholic last year, on the grounds that she said, I don't see Anglicanism rising to the challenge. So I'm I'm getting closer to the, the true faith. Uh, it's been very interesting going to Roman Catholic mass in the local cathedral because it gives me a sense of what they're actually doing. I have to say their, pre their gospel preaching is tremendous. Uh, they've got a couple of, 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 of duds, um, but they've got two evangelical young priests who, 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 who preach their hearts out and preach well and preach the truth. The other day we, we met one of the women who's trying to develop Catholic Alpha uh, and the hierarchy are very down on the would-be charismatic Catholics, but they need it so badly. And again, it's an example of how you can have a dominant culture which flourishes in one area, but, but just is frightened of or incompetent in another area that's necessary to build the church. We might even use the example of Trinitarian theology. You have to have the transcendence of the Father. You have to have a commitment to the living word. You have to have a Pentecostal experience and, and dynamic or, or else you're lacking some of the appetite. And I think this also might partly be a recipe for George's reunion of Christendom that I believe in so strongly. If we move that to where we are now, what do we die in the ditch over? Well, we're back to context again. The, the enemy has decided that the ditch is going to be about sexuality. We didn't decide that. In other, in other uh, cultures, in other times, in other decades and centuries, the enemy has perverted uh, life and sometimes the church and politics in a particular way. But today it's absolutely over personal identity, the, the givenness of gender and the way in which we use our sexual and other, but mainly sexual appetites. So even though I, 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 I'm now going to answer myself and earlier on saying, well, the variables are vocation and context, even having said that, it would be very surprising indeed if the whole church didn't in the end have to face up to the fact that the real fight with the culture surrounding us is going to be the one on sexuality. And that will be the, you know, it, for the Orthodox, it's ecumenism. But in Bucharest and in Romania, they're, they're not experiencing the liberal onslaught that Obama and uh, June Osborne represent. Uh, but, but where we are, that's the test. And I don't think many of us should or can sidestep it for very much longer, though I accept the variations of context and vocation. What do you think, George, are the biggest compromises the Episcopal Church has made? There's no such thing, Kevin, as the Episcopal Church. Okay, um, uh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> that's true. No, I, no, seriously, I right. there is no one voice. Um, and one of the uh, well, as an aside, one of my the Episcopal Church is a lo is is represented locally in the person of its bishop and the diocese, and it gathers in confederation every three years to do anodyne things. But if if we you if so, having made my little. A petty fogging statement. I'll I'll respond to your question. The Episcopal Church uh, has elevated materialism, man above God. They seek to find the answer to life's issues in perfection of human beings rather than 
finding the answer to life's issues in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, it's the same thing that the communists did 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it, and um, I'm not saying the Episcopalians are communists. If so, they're rather she-she wealthy communists. <laughs> uh, what I am trying to say is that it's the same heresy. Yeah. It's, it's the same choice. Uh, you know, the Episcopal, you know, under communism, the choice was the fist or Jesus Christ. Under the Episcopal Church, it's the phallus or Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to make a similar hand gesture. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe the Episcopal Church has uh, abandoned, uh, not intentionally, not intentionally, because most of these bishops, most of these lay leaders, there are a few, there are a disproportionately high number of nut jobs uh, in the Episcopal Church, but most of these bishops seek and want to do the good. And they try to be pastors, but they have no grounding. And their grounding has fallen into, and they respond to issues of life with therapy rather than a therapeutic response, rather than responding with the saving love of Jesus Christ, which well, provides I, an answer, hmm. but it's not, the, it's not the one that they're taught in school. Well, I'd like to jump on that because I think it's, it's so important. More and more, it seems to me that the... Uh, someone has described it as the fake Christianity of Anglicanism in this country. It's a harsh term, but I, 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 I'm going to use it because I, I think there's a moment for being clear about things. The fake Christianity of the Church of England, at any rate, is the presentation of God the Father as, as God the therapist, who simply wants you to be happy and soothe away any anxieties you may have. And that, that, that plays straight into the whole sexual agenda of the ungluing of Judeo-Christian ethics by the cultural Marxist tradition, because if you're presented with with um, the promise of of sexual and romantic happiness, and someone is saying all that matters is you're happy, but this is the way to do it, the two movements join together, and that's why it's so absolutely disastrous. And George, you say that, that the leaders want to do good, but everybody wants to do good. Jeremy, you know that the Satan comes to us. Uh, tempting us with the good. It's just that it, that it isn't the good, it appears to be. And so the, the, the problem we face as Anglicans are, is this, this handshake between, between a presentation of, of God, the, the fake therapist, and the promise of happiness lies in our romantic and erotic ambitions. Gavin, I think I'll, I'll, I agree with what you're saying, but I think I should point out that most communists, most uh, revolutionaries truly believe that they are taking the higher path, doing good. It's, no, the no. Rare, it's the rare scoundrel who does this for purely personal enrichment. But George, if I didn't, if I didn't make it clear, I was agreeing with you. Oh. The, 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 vision, the visionaries are all claiming to be doing good. Uh, communist, Marxist, Leninists were doing good for society. Our, the Episcopalian and Anglican bishops see themselves as crusaders for the good. We're right back to the issue of discernment. The, 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 what the devil does is to present us with, with sin and perversion cloaked in good and, and fool us. That's the... I, I, uh, I had a wasted youth in that I studied a great deal of the Marxist literature, Stalin and Lenin and and Stalin, I read many of Stalin's writings when I was in university. Um, I was preparing for a career in the CIA, lucky me. Uh, and look where I wound up. Uh, but uh, Stalin truly believed that the ends justified the means because the revolution, you needed to break a few eggs. That's a lovely French revolutionary phrase that Stalin took up. To You needed to break, crack a few eggs to make an omelet. You needed to have these temporary misfortunes to lead humanity into a higher state. And the result was untold suffering and murder and destruction. The, the same, I hear the same words. I hear the same thought patterns. We need to, uh, Gavin, you mentioned you were inadvertently included in a Twitter conversation uh, with some liberal Christian activists. Uh, it was it was really very interesting <laughs> because um, the, the, so there was a liberal, there was a, a gay Christian who was saying these idiot bigot traditionalists, they, they really don't get it. Do they really imagine that I would choose between romantic love and God? Duh! 
and and I want I, I thought for a moment this is this is brilliant. You have absolutely summed up the issue, and I wanted to write back. Yes, uh, that's the issue. You have to choose God over romantic love. Inconceivable to him because he had somehow, I think, with the therapeutic. Uh, romantic agenda uh, thought that they all com conflated together. One of the things that we're trying to do as Orthodox Christians is to make a distinction between Yahweh, the God of the holy God of creation and redemption, uh, and and human longing for for comfort and mutuality uh, in in our present culture. But I decided in the end I wasn't going to write back to him because all I would do would get trolled, and it probably wouldn't. You know, Twitter is not the place. So I, I didn't think to convert him, but I but I thanked him for putting it so wonderfully clearly, and I thought, well, this will help me be clear about the issues myself. Part of part, if I may, okay, Kevin, yeah, Maynard, sure. jump in. Um, part of my job, not only do I have I read when a great. One of you is tapping spot. your table. It's probably George. Okay, uh, let me sit on my hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I not I only have I read right here. <laughs> not only have I read great tracts of Marxist literature, I've also read most of the speeches. Uh, in my work as a as a reporter of bishops of the Church of England and Church in Wales, I've read June Osborne's diocesan addresses. Wow! Uh, I, so I've read this stuff, and it, I guess I'm a little numb. But for viewers of a certain age, you will recognize the phrase: "We have to destroy the village to save it." The that's from the Vietnam era. Yes. We have to destroy this communist. We have to destroy this village and kill all the communists in order it for it to be non-communist, which means killing everybody. Uh, June Osborne, though she will not use the word kill, has the same policy towards the church in Wales. We must destroy the church in Wales. We must destroy the patriarchy. We must destroy the traditions. We must destroy all the things that have kept people out of the churches and keep them down. Meanwhile, only 1% of the people show up for church, so that'll soon be half of 1%. But it is a, it, there's a death wish of destroying for the sake of destruction in order to create a new world. Um, I also think we threw out uh, 1,700 years of common sense. I'm going to go back to 1984, not the book. My <clears throat> semester fall freshman year, I took Psychology 101. Mm -hmm. Professor Anderson had us open our notebooks the first day handing out the syllabus and curriculum and says on the first page of your notebook i want you to write down one thing feelings are not facts yeah, i'll write that down go to the end of your notebook all right write down feelings are not facts i wrote it down and uh Throughout this course, just Psychology 101, Introductory to Psychology, um, he talked about therapy and, and kind of how we as humans delude ourselves through our feelings and through uh, taking what's here and making it our infrastructure. I think as a society and now as a church, we have come to believe that feelings are facts that what we feel is as real as it gets. Our emotions are more real than anything we could learn through scripture, through tradition, through reason, um, through all that humankind has learned as a civilization for 15,000 years. Which Kevin, is that's so helpful. And although we, <clears throat> we didn't exactly promise we wouldn't mention Justin Welby, but we noticed oh. we haven't given him any airtime <laughs> recently. It seems to me that, that the gender dysphoria uh, mm -hmm. is if you like, the pinnacle or the summit of the, the feelings are not facts. The facts of your biological anatomy and at war with your feelings about who you'd like to be or find it less painful to be, are, are, are the, the most ludicrous and painful and tragic extension of exactly that principle. And that's why it's all the more astonishing when Justin Welby writes the introduction to a transgendering educational leaflet commending feelings over facts and the church's backing for gender dysphoria and that whole agenda, uh, I think, is, is an, an exemplification of the way in which it's sold out to the very problem that your 101 psych prof told you to avoid in the first place. I, I want to take it 
th there's nothing new under the sun. Um, in my, I have uh, been fortunate to have been able to have long chats with some of the leaders of the of the new movements within the Episcopal Church, in particular, over the past twenty five years. And one of the phrases used again and again and again is "God is doing a new thing." Mm. And in my studies, I came across a fellow named Joachima Fiore, a 12th century yes. Catholic. Oh, wonderful Joachima Fiore. Yes, and, indeed. And Joachima Fiore is, uh, essentially posited that the three ages of man, there was mm. the Old Testament age, then there was the New Testament age, and now we are in the Holy age Spirit. of the Holy Spirit. That's mm. right. Yeah. So that Gene Robinson uh, uh, can tell me, and I says this because he says it with integrity, that God is doing a new thing. The Spirit is working in his life. He's not a perfect person. He doesn't hold himself out as exemplar of perfection. But he believes that the Spirit is at work informing him of God's new revelation, such that feelings are facts. And so this is a, a heresy that is now 800 years old, uh, if not older. Well, I, I, you're right, George. I, I just want to save Joachim Fiore from being uh, over-associated with Gene Robinson because, uh, I mean, dear, dear old Joachim Fiore, what he was after was, was holiness and the gift of the Spirit. So to, to some extent, um, he over-categorized the three stages. You're quite right. That was, a, that was an error, a mistake. But nonetheless, the, the age of the Spirit he wanted to usher in was the, the age of pure Pentecost, not um, not Robinson's uh, hijacking of, of of newness and freshness as a as a cloak for his own personal romantic ambitions. And people, I have been, uh, I, I read the comments, folks, and sometimes uh, Kevin doesn't delete them in time. Uh, but <laughs> the trolls. Why why am I harder on Justin Welby than I am on people like Gene Robinson? Why would we go out of our way to praise uh, Colin Coward on this show? Because there's a difference between people who are mistaken but are still of integrity. Mm. And then there are people who are out for the main chance. And I have come to believe that Justin Welby knows the good. He just chooses not to do it for reasons I can't quite understand. The he topic of the it. show is compromise. He's willing to compromise this to to save the Church of England. Welby, Welby will come to the communion partners group in the United States and these poor American conservative Episcopal bishops who are on their last legs think here is our savior, just as Rowan Williams was our savior, just as George Carey was our savior. And they hear him use his uh, HTB vocabulary, and they think he's on our side. And then we read in the, the press that on the same trip that he went to see the conservative Episcopal bishop, bishops, he saw the Bishop of Toronto, uh, suffragan of Toronto, and said, you know, I really am with you on your wanting to bring your gay spouse, but, you know, it's just... It's just not practical at this time. So even though I support you personally, we're going to have to give it a miss at this time. For me, Gene, Gene, uh, Gene Robinson is consistent, consistent in his error, but he's consistent and he seeks to, to live according to a code. Justin Welby will say one thing to one group and another thing to another group, all for the preservation of institutional authority, in my opinion. Can't disagree. Once again, we don't have smell of vision but I've been told that there's dinner cooking over there for Gavin, so we're going to uh, move on from this wonderful topic. We had a great full show. We are three shows away from 500. It should be fun. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do something fun. We're also going to introduce a new show. But Kevin, we'll talk about. You, can you I get something new? I you very kindly invited people to help support me in my ministry last, mm -hmm. last time, and uh, I've had one or two gifts, and I'm 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 hugely grateful. I've just been able to pay a bill for five hundred pounds for a purple Catholic. I was asked to buy in order to to to, to make a colourful protest outside an abortion clinic. Um, I've owed the money for some time and haven't been able to pay it. And uh, I'm I'm I woke up a very happy man. Can I just say I'm really truly grateful to those people who have been supportive. Oh, and. Somebody sent a donation to me for Gavin, a small amount, and their last name begins with a K, 
and I deposited it and I didn't write down who it was from. So I'm not able to send you your tax receipt in the United States. So if you sent a deposit, a donation to Gavin, care of me, and you've not received an acknowledgement, that is my mistake. Please contact me and tell me your name. I apologize deeply. So let me transition to how to donate to uh, our ministries. Gavin has a separate ministry, and we want you to be able to uh, donate to that. And in the show notes now, I keep a permanent link to his PayPal account. Um, and what, g- g- would it be okay if I included your email too in the show notes so people oh, could cool. contact you? And I'm going to put, put his thing. We also have a separate link if you want to give to Anglican TV and support the ministries that pay for my lights, uh, this fast internet connection where we can uh, do this type of thing um, and keep the ball rolling, so to speak, all the way up to episode 500. We appreciate your donations. You guys have been wonderful. You've sent a... Anglican TV has been to every continent in 12 years because of your faithful donations. And I I thank you for the bottom of my heart. It's been an experience of a lifetime as a reporter uh, to cover uh, a church trying to transform itself uh, to to, uh, return and repent. It's, It's wonderful to watch. I, I, Kevin, I, we, oh, we did oh, go to Canada, and it did seem like Antarctica, but yes, it does. we haven't been to Antarctica yet. But. I've not been to Antarctica. Um, apparently, we do not have a evangelical outreach to penguins yet. When that occurs, Anglican TV cameras are going to be there. I'm Kevin Carlson. Does it freeze? George, <laughs> you. <laughs> George, <laughs> you're gone in. <gasps> oh, my. <laughs> Uh, All right, I'm Gavin Ashenden. George, you can do the episode number because I think I've forgotten. And I'm George Conger, and this is episode 497. Was it 497? Yeah, you got it. 497 of Anglican Unscripted.